Hey, welcome everybody, and thanks for joining us today. I'm Jim Love, I'm the CIO of IT World Canada, and I'm your host for today's webinar, People Not Perimeters. So we've got great content for you today, but before we get started, I'm just gonna take care of a few housekeeping items in here. Um, one of them is, let's let, let's make this as interactive as we can, and, and we'd really like to to hear from you and, and get your, your, uh, your questions, your discussion in there. So please submit your questions through the Ask a Question box, and, uh, and we'll also be asking some poll questions through the through the presentation so please uh, to do that you have to make sure your pop-up blocker is turned off so uh, if you participate in the polls and, and add some questions we'll have a really great interactive discussion with you in there we will get you out of here on time you'll be you'll be in bed to, to your next meeting without any problems but so stick around get the full benefit of the program in there and at the end watch for a thank you email from us it'll, it'll have a download link to the presentation and and you should receive that email latest the end of the week but when you get that if you do me a favor take a minute and complete the evaluation form your feedback is just so essential in there it really helps us make the program's quality better and, and that's what we really want to do that's the housekeeping in there, so thanks a lot for, for sitting through that. You, here's the program you came for now, and, and that's um, it, it, this is an interesting topic, and I, you're going to love our guests on this and because I think you're going to get a lot from them. I certainly have in there, because uh, we're all facing this issue, is, is making the shift to the, the massive migration to work from home. We all did it really quickly. Good for you, and, and I, I, all my friends have told me, you know, we, we got that, and now we have to deal with the reality of supporting and securing what is really a new enterprise architecture. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm sure that, that everybody I'm talking to, and, and me in particular as well, still CIO of IT World, there, there are no shortage of new challenges. Organizations you have to grapple with support, with security, and a demand for a better user experience. And the, the pressure's on because Without that user experience, and you've all you've all felt this, without that user experience, you get workarounds and behaviors that defeat all the security that, that you've worked so hard to build in there. And you know, at the operating, we're operating at a speed. I don't know what it's been like for all of you. I I feel like I'm operating on warp speed uh, every day. And and you have little time to learn through trial and error. And you know, things that come up like you know, Azure, Active Directory, application suites, you know, these all require new approaches and, and new, new ways of attacking this in the, in the field. But, you know, there, there have to be new ways, new tricks, new ways to make this, this cloud architecture secure, stable, and productive. And what better way to learn those than to benefit from the experience of others who've done this successfully. And that's what our, our webinar is about today. So joining me today in this in-depth conversation are my special guests. We've got Ralph Lohan, he's the CEO of Hydrogy, and Curtis Johnston, who's the distinguished engineer with and Microsoft and MVP. And I gotta ask you about that one day, Curtis, from Quest. So welcome, Ralph and Curtis, both of you in there. Welcome, Ralph, you're out there. I'm out here, great to be here, Jim. Great, great, great to have you. Curtis, you're there? I am. Good stuff. This was gonna be a lonely approach if you weren't, but no. I, I, I knew you were here. So let's start out with a poll and we'll get, get our audience involved in this. So so um, let, let's talk about this. So uh, quick poll. What best describes where you are looking, what, what you're looking to hear about in here, uh, in there? So you select one of the following in there. What are you looking to hear about? Um, dealing with the complexity of identity management? Um, are you looking to hear about developing a strategy for the governance and identity management? Are you looking for practical tips on identity management? Pick the one that you think is most important. And if, if you really do ask, what is identity management? That's cool too. Um, so just, just uh, if you can just take a second and, and click in there. Um, I'll give you a second. I can't see the back end with, with, the, with the, the results coming in, but I have a rough idea of how long it takes. So I'm ticking this over in my head as you're doing that. So pick one of them. Are you dealing with complexity? Are you developing a strategy? Are you looking for practical tips? Or are you asking that question, what the heck is this anyway um, in there? So, and I think we, we should we should have enough in there. I'm gonna just call to our producer in the back end to, to uh, on the, Sophia, if you can just make that go live. Oh, we do, we've got, we're here, the, here are the results. So Ralph and Curtis, here we go. Um, 
poll results, people, they're not as interested in kneeling. Well, I'm sure they're, they're all interested in all three, but but their prime one they picked. Looking for practical tips on identity management. Yeah, there's a lot of people like me out there. Also strong, you know, developing a strategy and, and dealing with it. And bless you to the person who said, what is identity management? Because I'm, I'm, I don't have to ask this for, for our guests, but I'm sure they'll, they'll cover it as in there. Ralph and Curtis, I'm going to turn it over to you. Did you what do you think of the poll results in, in here? That's great. Uh, actually, I, I love that that's uh, practical tips on, on identity management. I think of ourselves as being <laughs> very much practitioners and, and actually trying to make sure that you have the right uh, tools and, and solutions to, to solve these problems. And, and most of my stories are, are oriented toward that. Uh, so so I, think, I think that the people who, who said that, uh, this will be a great presentation for them. Yeah, I absolutely. And you just to add to that, you know, a bit of a spoiler alert, but one of the things we really identify in this webinar is locking down, securing your identity and proper identity management is absolutely critical. So it's nice to see that the the audience uh, is looking for some practical tips on on how to achieve that, which we'll we'll go into. And I could promise you these guys know their stuff out there to people out there in the audience. So I'm going to turn it over to you. Let's let let's let you roll. Okay. Uh, thanks a lot, Jim, and uh, that was a great introduction and uh, glad to see that uh, everybody's a bit engaged on, on this topic. Um, just a bit about Quest and Idergy. We've been working together now for more than 15 years uh, around the whole Microsoft space, uh, really focusing a lot on security, uh, resiliency, et cetera, with our customers. Um, a lot of it was focused historically around Active Directory. And of course, that's evolved into the cloud, Office 365, Azure AD, uh, working a lot with identities, um, and uh, it's it's really this hand in glove type of relationship we have with uh, services together with uh, the right kind of products and being able to deliver those solutions for our customers. And uh, and so we actually have a Gartner article where we're mentioned uh, together as a recommendation for a top solution for companies that are looking for these kinds of solutions. And uh, and we do have uh, we're very proud on our part and as well Quest to be on their side of being highly recommended by Gartner for everything around things that would touch on identities in, in Active Directory and uh, the related tool set. So very proud of that and how we can deliver those, you know, managing services, uh, project services to our customers uh, with SLAs. But enough of that, uh, just really briefly, uh, IDRG at a high level, uh, uh, at a high level, these are kind of the, the quadrants where we might deliver these kinds of services. A uh, huge portion of what we do is that top left uh, uh, quadrant where we talk about identity and access management are really focused today. However, so much hand in glove with that cloud uh, movement to the cloud today. So as Active Directory on one side and having moved to Azure AD with our customers and working together with the Microsoft 365 and Office 365 and Azure today on the, on the top right. And very much this is the focus of where we'll be. Uh, and of course, we deliver database solutions and a lot of productivity, uh, collaboration and power platform things such as Power BI, et cetera. And all of them are closely related, of course, because identity sits at the heart of all of these things. Kurt. Yeah, just a quick uh, quick uh, note about Quest software because, um, you know, th there's a lot of management software companies out there. Uh, what, what really makes Quest stand out is we've been doing this for over 30 years. And we've been managing uh, Active Directory, migrating um, different workloads. Uh, we have over 130,000 customers um, and we're global. We're established, we're experienced, and we're, we're definitely a trusted partner. And when I say trusted, um, I, I sit on the R&D side of the, the fence and, and help our teams develop these great products. And I can tell you the amount of effort and expense we put into security and privacy has been um, it's been a lot it's been a lot of effort and sometimes it it you know you don't want to do that but uh security and privacy is absolutely paramount when customers are trusting us with the, with their data and their systems so we spend a lot of time uh, making sure we've done everything possible there and it's just a great partnership like uh, ralph mentioned you have fantastic tools and then you have the the uh, experience on the service side of knowing how to apply them when to apply them in certain scenarios so uh, it, it really is a great partnership there. And we'll just move on to a quick word about the, the agenda. Um, how this is going to work is we're gonna leverage ITRG's immense experience in the field. Ralph's gonna basically tell a customer story 
around identity management and good practices and uh, what, what's happened essentially in those scenarios. And then I'll follow along with some strategies to help address those scenarios, both from a native tool capability and even some uh, third-party software that could help. So Ralph, why don't you uh, kick it off with our, our first uh, story? Sure. Uh, actually, I put up a slide in here. Uh, sometimes best effort is not good enough. Uh, when we originally got into all this kind of work, um, there were a lot of customers out there saying, you know what, th that's really good, Ralph, but we've got really top level experts uh, working for us, third level guys. They, they understand these tools. They know what it's about. Um, and uh, there was a lot of confidence in their ability to, to resolve these types of issues. Uh, but the world has evolved a lot and good enough, uh, best effort isn't necessarily good enough in today's world. The impact of a breach or a governance failure can actually be uh, catastrophic, it can be huge. And a good strategy needs to take into account uh, really two different sides of it. We need to protect ourselves and protect our identities, for those, those key accounts against breaches. At the same time, we can't stop it all and we have to build in resilience in order to restore our environments uh, to be up and running within acceptable time and cost limitations. It's impossible to secure it 100%. We all know that. Uh, we hope, but we, we know it's not going to happen. So we need to be ready for the scenario when it doesn't happen. I've got a couple of, uh, of those kind of horror stories. Uh, we work so much with our customers in this area. We, we find out about things that, that likely most people never find out about. Uh, as most know today, it's not possible to stop everything. We'd have to, yeah, kind of have to look and say, what is what is material for for my company? What kind of resiliency do we really need? Resiliency is that ability to be up, back up and running within an acceptable time limit. And and what is that? Uh, how we respond when there's been a breach? Uh, so there's this whole idea of continuity uh, versus the risk and and the cost of of doing that. So if I go to my my first example. Uh, we've been doing this for a long, long time, and there are some things that affect everything on the network, okay? And today, because we've extended Active Directory into the cloud, uh, we can actually have situations where everything becomes inaccessible, either for a user and sometimes company-wide. And so we have, we have a number of experiences working that we, we've been known as Active Directory specialists for a long time. And uh, as I was saying there before, uh, some companies thought that, wow, we have it all in hand. We know how to do these things. We know how to restore Active Directory. Uh, we've got the processes. We practice this from time to time. But you can just hit that little slice. And, and it's funny how the wrong things happen at, at the wrong time. Uh, we, had, we had one situation. In fact, we landed in the managed services business originally when we were working with a customer. And all of a sudden, they, they had an outage. Uh, and they didn't know what would have gone wrong, and, and they ended up having to send almost 10,000 workers home for a shift in a manufacturing uh, situation. And the problem wasn't that you know SAP wasn't working or that the controls to the equipment weren't working. The problem was that the people weren't able to log in, the workers were not able to log in, and and it was ended up being a complex problem. Uh, and it took them the better part of the eight hours to get it back up and running, so that so that those users could once again log in and do everything they're used to doing. They didn't know they deployed a mission critical application. They didn't have the right kind of response in place. Uh, we, we saw a situation too, another, another situation where a customer had a uh, transportation network across North America, and it was just an unusual situation, a very small permission, well, permission one small part and off OU inside of Active Directory and, and a, and a consultant was working, he was migrating something, and uh, he set off a process that actually ended up shutting down Active Directory and transportation stopped across a, a continent. And, uh, and as the CEO is phoning in every hour to the CIO and the CIO is sitting beside a technician, that third level expert, and the third level experts on the phone with Microsoft uh, Premier Support trying to restore something uh, that had been highly secure, had been locked down, followed many best practices, but an obscure thing brought it down. Uh, so these are, I was telling you, I was gonna bring you some horror stories and this on its own, you could look at it and say, okay, that's Active Directory legacy. Uh, we've moved on to Azure uh, now and Azure AD. The problem is almost all, any size company today is working with a hybrid scenario. 
And these kind of potentials uh, just get exacerbated if it actually get, it locks down things that are going on in the cloud today. So these were due to human error. Now we can add in the focus with malicious hackers who may want to damage, or they might demand ransoms, or steal intellectual property. Uh, best effort is start looking and saying, wow, that's, that's just not good enough. We, we need to raise our level uh, of maturity and our strategies, our execution capabilities to block these kinds of attacks, to be able to respond and restore within acceptable service levels. Eight hours can be acceptable in one company, but entirely insufficient in the next company. Uh, and so this is the kind of thing we have to start th stop and look at and say, well, wait a second. Uh, and, and can we afford that expertise? Uh, this is a, maybe something happens once every four years, five years, and in uh, how, how we're going to handle that when it happens. And uh, today with the coronavirus, I was thinking about it, uh, Kurt, uh, many companies have rapidly deployed the remote, uh, re remote workforce and, and deployed various technologies to enable the productivity of that workforce. So the risk uh, was necessary to deploy it as is. Everybody just sort of threw the tools out there uh, because, wow, this, this kind of just flew at us and we weren't ready for it. And uh, But now it's there. We actually have to step back and look and say, well, wait a second. Uh, what kind of things have we exposed? Just because nothing's happened, bad has happened in six months now, doesn't mean it's not just around the corner. Uh, these things are just coming around to everyone. And so now that we have got all of these remote users deployed, how do we know who all those remote users are? Are they even all of our people that are out there? Uh, are they who they say they are? Uh, and and what kind of well, what kind of access do they have? And, and I think there's I think we'd be surprised if we actually were able to find out who are the people that are actually using uh, and accessing some of the information. And so it's a pretty important thing. And then of course, uh, if they're not who they say they are, what are the risks? Uh, when there's been any kind of a breach, we have to assume it's malicious and we have to prepare by asking, you know, what is that resiliency? What are we gonna do about it? So there's some really big challenges. The second, the, uh, second story here, uh, Kurt, if you let me just tell the second one, because I think it leads to, to your part. Uh, in mid-March, just as the lockdown started, one of our retail customers, uh, and they had several thousand users and they had hundreds of outlets uh, and they experienced a breach and, and they lost all of their ability to take credit card transactions. Now, the point of entry for the breach was thought to be a, through a compromised account, uh, an identity. And, uh, and governments, of course, uh, were discouraging cash transactions, uh, cash being a primary way uh, of, of spreading the virus at that point. And uh, so, they were being encouraged to use credit cards, but uh, but they ran into this problem. Uh, they were an essential service, they're allowed to be open, but their Active Directory actually crashed and they were not able to do credit card transactions. What were the different applications, et cetera, et cetera, that, 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 did, that was rather complicated, but they had a true crisis and they discovered that the breach had attacked their AD. They worked with a global provider to try and restore that over 10 days uh and you got to imagine the pain and then actually after about 10 days finding the uh, they turned to us since we had implemented and managed our office 365 environment for them uh, beside it was also affecting that and they said to us wow uh, we can't live with this pain anymore can you solve it so so i'm rather proud that we were able to go in and in just a few hours able to resolve that problem for them get them back to what they would have called business as usual so i'm proud of the outcome uh, and the important thing uh, is really for them to ask that question, what could they have done differently? Uh, and uh, there's, there's lots of things they could have done differently. And, uh, and Kurt will tell you some of those in a moment. But uh, I know in talking with uh, the customer, just by implementing MFA, multi-factor authentication alone, they could have put phenomenal protection on their end user accounts. They, they could have got probably greater than 99% of that protection there. If they'd been properly monitoring, they could have detected the breach as it was occurring and not later. Um, we work with some of the, the tools in our managed services like Change Auditor to monitor you know, things that are happening uh, in Recovery Manager if we have to restore it and we can restore in a fraction of the time you, compared to using native tool sets. Uh, and this works of course in the cloud, not just with Azure AD, not just at AD. So this customer knew of these options, had considered them, just hadn't taken the action when the crisis happened. And, and that's the challenge. Uh, on the flip side, uh, I, could, I could tell you a really boring story. I have a second customer, 5,000-ish users, uh, global manufacturing, sites in Canada and around the world. Um, just before COVID came along, they had activated uh, their MFA 
and uh, and as a result uh, they could monitor and they could see that there were people trying to ca uh, you know access privileged accounts um and they were being thwarted and uh, so nothing happened uh, could something have happened yes but nothing happened and that's actually kind of a boring story um but it's actually what we all want uh, boring is actually uh, what we're all after. We don't want these bad things to happen. But anyway, Kurt, off to you. Yeah, thanks, Ralph. So, uh, you know, the biggest thing I, I take away from those stories is uh, just how crucial identity is. So if you lose the identity, you can really be out of business until you get it uh, uh, back up and running. And, uh, you know, we'll talk uh, in a little bit about preventing those breaches in the first case, but let's talk a bit about business continuity in the face of a breach. And Ralph, the other thing I took away from your story too, your experience in the field, whether it's a tiny obscure change, an unintended configuration change, an outage of some sort to Active Directory, or um, a, a breach, uh, ransomware or malware, um, at some point it'll it'll likely happen. So it's all about preparing for that almost inevitable uh, scenario. And you can see some of the statistics up here in terms of a, a breach. Uh, 95 million AD accounts are under attack every day. Um, every 14 seconds, another ransomware attack occurs. So our systems are constantly being tested from a security perspective. It's really important to do whatever you can to prevent that breach in the first place. But if there is a breach, um, it's really, really important that you've planned beforehand to address it. And what does that mean? Um, it means having a business continuity plan, which includes the process and the people to contact in the tool set, uh, making sure you have it installed, configured, you know how to use it, and the people in your IT or, or recovery department know how to use it to get that business up and running. And also, I can't emphasize this enough, and I've seen this in a number of enterprises, they have a process, they have the tool set and some of the expertise, but they've actually never practiced it, right? So you don't want to be practicing this uh, during a breach. So know your process, know your tool set, and, and you know, give it a trial run a couple of times. Uh, and let's talk about backup and, and recovery. So um, as, as Ralph's stories uh, identified that identity, right? You just, you want that to be resilient. So whether it's an IT administrator that just accidentally deleted a group or deleted a security group, um, or you have a complete outage, having a backup of on-prem AD beforehand is really crucial. And likewise, in the cloud, uh, Azure AD, there's a common misconception that that's just backed up because it's in the cloud. Um, it's not. So if someone deletes a security group in the cloud or a group membership that um, backs a number of key business applications, um, there is no backup for that. So uh, you have a couple of different options. Um, in terms of backup and recovery right now, the native tool set is limited um, for Active Directory. There are some applications like uh, Microsoft Teams and Office 365 groups from a Microsoft perspective there's a lot of soft deletes, which are recoverable within 30 days. But from an Active Directory perspective, you really want to make sure you have a full full backup that you can recover from. And um, there's some third-party solutions out there. Uh, Quest has one called a Recovery Manager for Active Directory, and then a complete SaaS version for Azure Active Directory called On Demand Recovery for Azure Active Directory. And that protects you from everything from um, a uh, group membership deletion, a full group deletion, a user account deletion, you can recover right away. And the two products work um, work together so that if there's an on-prem um, AD outage and you have DirSync set up, it will actually uh, restore the, the uh, appropriate Azure AD bits that were wiped out on-prem. Uh, so look around, there's different um, uh, backup and recovery tools. And also, you know, what you want to think about, and Ralph touched upon this, um, in your tool set, you want good insight into what's changing in your, your identity system. Um, there's better native capabilities there. Uh, Microsoft PowerShell can be used to pull a lot of the, the configuration. We'll talk more about that later. Um, but there's also some good third-party solutions out there also um, to monitor what's changing in your identity system. And then in the face of a breach, you really want to know what changed. 
So with that, uh, Ralph, won't you tell us another uh, another story? And, and 95 million accounts under attack at all times it isn't a sounding number, um, but it's possibly even that first number where you talk about 55% uh, of breaches are actually from internal uh, creates a, a particularly big challenge for identity, doesn't it? But yeah, the identity governance problem, uh, we're, we're talking a lot these days, actually a, a driver for, for cleaning up identity uh, to some extent is even HR, uh, human resources, where they maintain actually incredibly good records of, of who are the employees in a company and the uh, information on them, are they working, what, kind of, what department are they in, what should their profile be, uh, when do they leave? And so uh, you would think it'd be relatively simple if an employee has been terminated to have his access removed. Uh, but apparently this is quite difficult and uh, audits demonstrate uh, repeatedly uh, that when auditors come in six months or a year later, that accounts are found all over the place that are still active for employees that have left. And, and we get a certain amount of comfort from the fact that, well, if they can't log in the network, uh, these accounts are, you know, their background things, but there's compromises on these all the time. And as well, when you think of breaches as coming from internals, often as from external, uh, we can't uh, be too lax about it. So HR actually does a phenomenal job most of the time inside of the HR tool set, whatever that tool set might be. However, if there's not a coordinated way of, of disabling, uh, deactivating accounts on the other side, the identities on the other side, you can actually get this situation where it's probably the worst of all worlds. You think you're secure, but you're actually not secure. Um, and so you've got this, this, this detached, it's uncoupled. And so, uh, you know, and it gets really complex. Uh, I know one financial institution uh, where they've got six to eight eighty user active directory user accounts in addition to all the other system accounts for each employee. Um, so how can HR know that access has been removed from all these systems? It's in most companies today, it's very manual process. HR will open a ticket that goes to IT. IT receives this ticket. They manually go in and they disable the accounts. They, you know, they close the ticket say, by sending it back and HR looks and goes, good, check mark, done. But nowhere do they actually have the insight from one side to the other to make sure that they've captured all of the different uh, systems employees when they come on board they, they move around a lot uh, so the technologies existed uh, while well, Kirk for 20 years already to go in and to manage this kind of, of thing uh, we call it identity management um, so the tools exist but the governance expectations due to the kinds of breaches and enormous economic costs has actually made this much more important and firewalls no longer do the trick um, the firewall is no longer the perimeter the it's not the devices that a user has that's a perimeter. We used to be able to lock down a, a desktop or a laptop and we did the job, but now people want to be able to access from their home uh, machines. They want to be able to access through their phones and they're coming in through all these different places. So the user is really now the endpoint. And so we need to actually find a way now to actually block all of this. So uh, last year we worked with one of our enterprise customers uh, to help them fix some of their identity governance problems. And, and it actually we could demonstrate it using this HR relationship, it was taking them up to three weeks to onboard a new employee, which is a, a huge issue. Uh, you know, you can get them up and running, logging in, using email the first day, that's easy. But, you know, and, and, and they might even have a profile giving them some of the major accesses for that given department. However, it was, they were experiencing a lot of pain. It would often take up to three weeks by the time they got phone access and, and then they would, oh, we forgot about this one, we forgot about this one. So the tickets are open along the way. You keep adding permissions or privileges along the way. Why? Well, these things aren't actually documented. And so if they're not documented when you're onboarding, they're probably not documented now when it comes, it comes time to offboard either. But be as it may, we actually have worked with them as a process. You have to fix your supply chain and everything else. But we help them bring down that onboarding process to a day compared to three weeks and in and, and a very, very um, consistent basis. So that's a really big challenge. And there's a lot that has to be fixed uh, that that's goes beyond identity, but identity is a really important, important part of it. And if you know what you're activating and you're giving the right profile when they come on, you also know how to remove that after they've gone. And so we're proud of what we've achieved as a team together with our customer. Uh, many of our customers have the other, another problem too, that long-term employees have moved jobs multiple times. And each time they get new permissions and privileges, very often you're doing your new job and your old job at the same time. 
So you got to keep all those old permissions and somebody's got a, a potentially a post-it or something with a note saying, oh, I got to remember to remove those permissions from the old one in three weeks. Oh, and then it becomes six weeks and and it's lost. And and we get these users just drag massive amount of permissions. Uh, I've seen situ situations of people changing eight jobs and just uh, just huge amount of permissions they drag forward. Um, and over and over, when these employees leave, uh, you get the ex-employees and auditors are finding these, these ex-employees with access to highly sensitive, restricted corporate information, and you can't be sure if anybody has actually accessed that information. So it happens because there's so much that's done that's manual, and, and these things can be solved. And they're not terribly hard to solve, but we got to do bite size here and, and go at it and start chipping away at it. Uh, and Kurt, I, I think you have a bit to add to that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the biggest thing I, I took away from that story, Ralph, is uh, people still use po post-it notes. <laughs> Hopefully um, for not, not for their passwords, we hope. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, it, it's a good point that um, yeah, what you pointed out was you, from an identity governance perspective, it really makes sense to have a handle on that identity footprint so that identities, especially privileged ones, don't get lost in the shuffle. And if people are using post-it notes as a reminders, um, yeah, that's gonna that's gonna be a problem. Um, but you know, whether it's an Outlook task reminder or uh, some sort of you know, ticket in a in a system, these things do get lost, and uh, it's really important, especially the privileged identities, to make sure you have a good handle on them that they're locked down. Which leads me to my my first point, and, and this goes back to preventing that breach in the first place. That's why we do identity governance. First thing, make sure your security basics are covered. And uh, Ralph, you mentioned MFA. That's just a no-brainer. There's uh, some statistic that Microsoft released, I think uh, three or four weeks ago, came across my radar. It's like 98 or 99% of all AD account breaches were non-MFA enabled identities. So just do it. There's a couple different options there in terms of um, configuring that properly for your organization. Um, and once that's done, there's native capabilities in the cloud if you're in Azure AD to really help control control identity uh, from a privileged access pers perspective, uh, specifically things like Azure AD conditional access policies. But going, going back to um, people, not perimeters, um, you have people with privileged um, AD, Azure AD accounts now who are remote, remote workers use conditional access policies to lock down the resources they have privileged access to and when they have access to that resource. Um, and that's exactly what that, that feature set does. So take a look at your, your native capabilities. Um, Microsoft has fantastic documentation on, on all, all of that in Azure AD. And one, one thing you highlighted, Ralph, too, again, going back to the identity footprint, more than ever, there's mergers happening, there's acquisitions, there's consolidations. And that's when things change and identities get lost. So if you are merging with another company, um, you're migrating from one Office 365 tenant to another for whatever reason, migration's a great time to do a pre-assessment, clean up any identities, privileged or not, that are not being used. And the lesser identity footprint you have to deal with, the more secure you, you will be. And, um, Next, you know, knowing your identity configuration. So they're, they're everything from um, knowing what privileged users you have to any configuration, like those conditional access policies, know them, report on them frequently, know when they change. Uh, so natively you can use things like uh, PowerShell to uh, enumerate privileged access, um, which accounts have it. Uh, you can, enumerate and pull back uh, guest access, external access, who outside your company has access, baseline that, and then know when it changes. And uh, if you don't have the in-house expertise, and it, it can take a lot of expertise to script all this, schedule it, send it to the right people, review it, there are third-party solutions out there to help. And again, Quest has um, a couple of solutions in this regard. Quest Enterprise Reporter, it can be set up to um, gather all the key uh, configuration right down to granular permissions in your organization. It's automated, scheduled, it can be sent out as reports to the right people. And lastly, after you baseline that configuration, it's all set. Um, 
back to the spirit of preventing breaches, you really want to govern, govern and monitor. And I mentioned this before. Um, if you're purely in the cloud from an Azure AD Office 365 capability standpoint, there is native auditing. Uh, it can be a bit cumbersome to set up, but generally it, it's good. Um, if you're hybrid, I strongly recommend you look at some third-party solutions. Um, and Ralph, I know your your company has a lot of experience with this one, uh, Quest Change Auditor. And what's really nice about it, it goes very, very deep into on-prem Active Directory. But if you're a hybrid, it gives you a single pane of glass into Azure AD, on-prem AD, and even cloud and on-prem workloads such as Exchange, SharePoint, and soon to be released Microsoft Teams. And that's really useful for um, alerting and watching for anomalous activities and watching what's happening in those privileged uh, accounts. And if you have a security team or a CISO, uh, they're probably doing something similar, which is great, but I can't emphasize enough security is everybody's responsibility and your application infrastructure teams, your IT personnel, they need a tool set just for applications to get some visibility and to know what's going on. And we, we've had uh, customers of, of Quest Software where many times they've actually caught a security incident, a breach early and before the security team did, uh, which was fantastic. Um, it, just, it just sort of emphasizes that application security and identity security sometimes is, is niche and needs its own set of uh, security uh, tools. Anything to, to add there, Ralph? Yeah, no, that's excellent. I, I like the, the whole concept that these tools are self-learning, uh, which is so important because there's just no way in the world you can document all and, and trust the documentation of every access that's, you know, that's given and, and how, and actually, what does it take, six months or something very often for a, a compromised account to actually get used? by a malicious hacker and there's no way to know that something unusual is going on until that person starts doing something different than what they've always done yeah. because they've they've got their proper password uh, they've logged in appropriately for all anybody knows it's just that employee that's doing it and the only way to find out is that they're doing something different than normal and so these see these kinds of things are huge to be self-learning and then start noticing anomalies, flag it, and uh, there's tools, of course, from Microsoft, and then you've got these tools that add on, and that combination is just a really simple way to 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 try and spot these things and and stay a step ahead. Uh, and actually, you did a good segue. You mentioned Teams. Teams has been explosive. I'm not going to spend long. We're running out of time here, but there's been this explosive growth of, with Teams as a solution. You know, as a solution to this problem, it, it was already growing really fast, and then COVID hit, and people went remote. And if you had already planned on, you know, purchased teams, you're planning to deploy it, it, everybody just lit it up. This was not the time to do it right. This was just the time to get it out there. And that was the right time, uh, right decision at the right time. Users have loved the tool. And when users find out, it's so simple to create a, a, a new team, to, working on a solution and to include others uh, in different silos in the organization. And, and it's fabulous for doing that. And then we found out that we can actually invite people in from business partners, customers. So now we have people outside the organization that are accessing it. And as long as you know we stay with that the original intention, uh, it works out well. But these teams have a way of, of living on and, and people coming back in and continuing to use it. We forget about who all has access and, and companies are finding out that external users, uh, non-employees are getting access to confidential data. And again, uh, so the where the flag is coming up, that uh, we've had an internal auditor flag it to a board of directors, and the board of directors came along and said, whoa, what's going on here? How come we're finding out that non-employees are accessing confidential restricted information? Um, and this is a, this has now become an issue that, that directors of a corporation are interested in. Uh, and uh, so it's, a, it's, it's an important question to answer. Uh, we can't just add people in and forget about them. So we need governance on this. Uh, it's a disaster waiting to happen if we don't, but it is a problem that can be managed. And uh, and again, there's solutions out there that can manage it. Kurt. Oh, sorry, we skipped ahead one slide there. Um, yeah, so let's talk about uh, governance for a, for a remote workforce, uh, which really, it, it lends itself well to the, um, 
uh, explosive growth growth of Teams, like you were you were saying, Ralph. And what's really interesting, specifically about Microsoft Teams, is um, that explosive growth uh, and how it presents a risk is almost directly dependent on just how uh, useful it is. People are creating Teams left, right, and center, um, just adding tons of documents, you know, sometimes sensitive information into those Teams. And I have a lot of Teams experience, and we call it the life cycle problem is one of the big risks in terms of governance. Um, and it's it's about uh, looking at the life cycle of a specific team. So a team is started with a specific group of people for a specific purpose. The documents, all the data is added, the, the channel me uh, channel messages, and then at some point that project reaches its conclusion, and then it just sort of goes stale. Um, and this can represent a real risk. Uh, you can have teams that are talking about acquisitions, um, sensitive HR issues. It's really important that Number one, you know who has access to that data, who has external access, so who are guests external to your organization that have been inv invited in to uh, collaborate in that team, and more important from a life cycle perspective, that it's cleaned up after it's outlived its purpose. So a couple practical uh, tips there. Um, there are some native tools now to help control the life cycle challenge. One I'll call out is Azure AD expiry policies. And Microsoft has ramped this up from a capability standpoint. And one feature I really, really like here is you can set a policy such that if the team hasn't been used or accessed for a certain period of time, um, the owner of that team or owners get a message to attest that that team is still required. And then if it's not, it is uh, deleted, soft deleted, uh, which means basically you have 30 days to recover it. So that's a really nice way just to uh, you know clean up that life cycle, make sure no sensitive data or just organizational data is just out there um, lurking in the weeds. And also uh, back to my you know first point on this slide, knowledge is power. I talked about you know gathering regularly, baselining that configuration uh, with Microsoft Teams. It's no different. You want if if your organization is concerned about what data is in Teams and who has access to it from the outside, you can gather this with uh, some native tools like PowerShell. Again, it requires some in-house expertise. Um, and if you want to automate it and alert on it, uh, you know you need to put some development um, effort into that and, and to maintain it. And much like uh, identity governance too, if, if that's not something your organization is prepared to do, um, there are third party solutions which can really help out here. Uh, Quest has one, again, Enterprise Reporter, it can go deep into Teams configuration, which external people have access to which teams. And again, it's a fantastic partnership with Idrigy. You, you can come in, you can configure Enterprise Reporter for the specific things uh, that an organization needs to, to look out for. And we talked about, um, you know, after it's baselined and um, you know your configuration, you really want to stay on top of it. Uh, and you want to stay on top of uh, it being the configuration and access even before those remote workers come in. Because as Ralph pointed out, um, solutions like Quest Change Auditor learn what's normal behavior. And it's able to sort of flag anomalous activity, which is really, really useful and um, really useful for teams too, in terms of, hey, is someone external that hasn't accessed content for three months, now are they accessing a lot of it? I'll also call out, uh, and this is less about identity, identity man management, it's more about cost benefits. A lot of um, enterprises, when they rush to the cloud uh, during COVID for the re remote worker scenario, uh, they didn't give a lot of thought um, to their licenses and they just bought a lot of licenses or they uh, modified what they had and licensing is difficult it's complex and uh, we found at quest software there's a lot of uh, room to optimize what's there in terms of who's using what what products they're licensed for and then also just saving money on on unused licenses so there there's a quest product on demand license management which um really does a great job inventorying all your licenses. And then it actually looks at what users have been using those licenses. Um, and it flags unused licenses, licenses that are just like disabled and not assigned that represent just a very easy cost savings. 
And then also how this ties into governance too. You don't want um, a dormant account out there licensed for access to some of these applications like Microsoft Teams if they don't need it. So it sort of helps uh, give you visibility to that too. Um, yeah, and the, the biggest thing I, I, I can just reiterate here is just know your configuration, stay on top of it, and uh, you know leverage partners like IRTG just make sure it's configured, set up, and, and working for your organizational needs. Anything uh, to add there, Ralph? I'm all good. I see Jim's there. That means that uh, it's time to transition on. I mean, I'm back, and I turned my camera off, so you weren't watching me viciously write notes here. You guys were. This was terrific, and I, I, I don't. I, I, I say that honestly. I, I, I sat through the rehearsals with you, and we still. I still learned stuff from here. I, and Ralph, you, you get my award because I've never heard planning and teams in the same sentence before. So that's good. Uh, just kidding. Uh, but the other one is is you've also given us a tip. We talked about tips. Here's a tip for getting recognized by the board of directors. Everybody in IT wants to be recognized by the board of directors, and you've showed us exactly how to do that and end your career at the same time. So no, I think that's, this has been great. There's some good tips and some good ways to prevent us from getting that unwanted attention that we want, or that we don't want in there and really showing the, 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 the job. And, and I think you pointed it out great, we want boring. So we're gonna do one more poll and then we'll, we'll let you, we'll do a wrap up and get these guys out of here. It's just great. So you've heard all of this and, and how concerned are you about your remote workforce? I think the guys have given you some good perspectives, some good tips and things like that, but give it, let us know where you, where you are on this. Um, and I'll tell you, I'll, I'll tell you afterwards what my answer would be for that in terms of the remote workforce in there. Are you extremely concerned, very concerned, moderately, or what remote workforce in there? Um, so we'll let you get those, those answers in there. And then we'll come back and, and do a little bit of a wrap up in there. Like I said, I, I thought this was this was terrific. So just give us your poll answers and, and thanks for, for, for responding to the polls. Thanks for the questions and things like that. If we get a few minutes, we'll get some questions. And if you can keep putting the questions in there, if we don't get there to them, we will definitely, uh, we'll, you, we'll get somebody to answer them for you in there. So extremely 20%, very and moderately, yeah. So that, and at least nobody said what remote workforce. What do you think guys? Good audience. Yeah, actually, the results, uh, they're not, not that surprising. Um, you know, we, we, it's been working terrific. The technology, the tool sets have been working really, really well. Um, and, uh, but it, it, it underlines, uh, we all have this challenge now with remote workers, uh, the person being the perimeter now, uh, and, and we just have to focus in and, and just, just close the doors as we go along to make sure that the right people uh, that are, are accessing data that should be accessing data or whatever it is they're accessing. That's very good. Yep, and okay. it's, uh, it's encouraging to see that, you know, overall 80% of people are at least, you know, have their eye on this, that they, they you know, take it seriously and think that should have some governance around uh, the remote workforce and um, should take maybe some active steps to just make sure they're uh, dotting their I's and crossing their T's. Yeah, I'm, I'm more with the Andy Grove School, the only the paranoid survive. I'd be, I'm always in the extremely, and that's because I just love what, what Ralph described, a dull night. That's a one, yeah. you know, but, but well, you've, been, that's, you've been a CIO. You don't need those other nights, right? Oh, yeah. No, I, I don't even have an alarm clock anymore. I wake up in the middle of the night screaming and I will after this webinar. I think of all the things I got to check off on my list. So this, but, but I, I say that with great humor. This has been great, guys. Thank you very much. You want to just take a little wrap up and then we'll, we'll see if we get some time for some questions. Oh, uh, yeah, I, I, I don't have time to talk about this one. Really, all it's just about saying, where are you and where do you need to get to? Uh, you know, you know, you need to find out for your industry and where you're at, uh, where on the on the scale of maturity uh, you need to get to. Uh, not everybody has to be up at a five. You might be in an industry where a 3.5 or four is sufficient, and maybe you think you're at a two. And, and how do you get there? Um, it's it's about improving where you're at. Uh, you know, it's uh, we didn't get we didn't get to where we are overnight, and we won't solve it overnight. But you need to put a strategy in place, saying, okay, how can we step forward? And that's all we intended to show you. But yeah, why don't we get over to the questions? I'm sure there must be a few questions. Indeed. Yeah, and I think that the, the big thing is know where you are and move forward a little. You know, that just just move move. Every time you move forward a little, you you get you get closer to that good night's sleep in there. So let's do a couple of questions in here. Um, and here's a good one. How do we get started? And I think that's the legitimate question. We we're all in the middle of this. What would your advice be just to get get us started in moving in the right direction? I can take a take a shot at that. Um, we're probably going to sound like we're repeating ourselves, but if you haven't 
done those sort of identity basics like MFA and just uh, knowing your baseline, that is a great place to start. And uh, from my experience, I know what, what you've seen, Ralph, but taking those first few basic steps gives you a massive leap on preventing breaches and responding to them from a resilience perspective. So uh, definitely, uh, you know, that, that would be my, my answer there. Yeah, cool. I, I always find that you can't really even just document where you are without automatically wanting to improve some things. And uh, it's just a part of that process, but really understanding where you are and in your industry or your particular company's requirements, what do you, what do you need to get to and making sure that you have those, those pieces and you know what has to be done. We got to start there. And, and again, I think it was well answered by Kurt. Yeah, so Ralph, and Kurt, you, you guys would sit down. I think these maturity models, I love these maturity models. At least sit down with someone and say, where are you right now? Where are you going to? In there? So yeah. Yeah, okay. I think we've got past this place of saying that, wow, we need to be a five on all things. That, that business can't work, that we can't afford those kinds of solutions. Um, there are some things where we need to, and you could do this scale based on security. You can do it on operational processes or whatever. Um, we, we just have to look and say, well, wait, in, in this area, we can accept a certain level of risk. Um, just make sure you're resilient, that you can get back into an operational state in an acceptable period of time. Whereas there's some other areas we can't tolerate uh, any, you know, any risk. And so we got to do the maximum we can to secure it or, or whatever that happens to be. And, and so, yeah, you need to just have a very clear mindset. And, and this is where uh, that assessment becomes hugely important. We, are, we love to come in alongside of our customers as a, as a third set of, you know, third set of eyes and say, okay, here's what we're seeing, where you are, excellent. You're doing well here. There's some areas for improvement there and uh, we can help you now to get to where you need to be or suggest that perhaps there's a service that exists already at level four that you could then hand that off, you know, in a specialized area, hand it off to a company that's qualified to do it. Um, we'd love to do that in certain areas where we're qualified. There's other companies in, in different areas we don't do that operate at a level four or level five, and you can just outsource that as opposed to trying to change your whole company. But the, these are things that need to be tackled. Okay. Um, I think we got a few more. So, do, another, and you've probably covered this, but I think it's a good recap in here. But what are two or three of the best practices for governance that that you think should should just jump out at people? Well, again, I'll, I'll sound like I'm I'm repeating myself because I'm a big fan of it, and I've, I've seen I've seen it really uh, deliver results. And that's and it, it ties into just knowing where you stand. So doing that baseline configuration of what your identity footprint looks like in terms of privileged accounts and any configuration that um, monitors or gives access to those privileged accounts to the various systems. So just knowing that um, and monitoring for changes and having the tool set in place to detect problems with that potential security breaches and anomalous activities is really, really important. Yeah. I, I, I like to think of one word, uh, simplify. It's a word we like to use in our company a lot because we work with a lot of tech, a very complex technology. And, and one of the challenges is just to clean up and uh, and consolidate uh, your identities and, and the different things that are out there. And, and it's a huge job. I, I don't think there's a CIO that ever got a pat on the back for doing that kind of a project. And yet, one of the simplest ways to secure operation is to do that cleanup, make sure that everybody that's there should be there uh, consolidate it so you can manage it more effectively. Um, and while we, we do a lot of that kind of work uh, for our customers, it's a, it's outside of normal operational work. Uh, you know, maybe it's a series of acquisitions done over 10 years and these things just roll forward. Everything still works. Uh, Active Directory and together with Azure AD is an amazingly flexible and stable tool um, until it isn't. And, uh, and so it's just, just a matter of just keeping that caught up and uh, and making sure you've you've got it in, in, in a clean operational state. And that goes so far because it's so easy to manage after that with some of the things that were mentioned. So uh, it's really simple. It's going to the basics. Yeah, and no matter what you do, something goes wrong. And I think that's, you know, that that's part of it. One of the things you talked about, Ralph, was there just, this is my own question in your formatting what somebody said, but, but just to get the answer to it. I think there are a lot of, if you have these orphan accounts sitting out there, they're, I think a lot of people say, well, yeah, but the person's left the company, they're going to be okay. Well, old passwords, those those accounts are still active. They still could, if you can breach the wall, the, your perimeter defenses, such as they are, you can, you can get and test a lot of, and do a lot of damage with old accounts, particularly with reused passwords and things like that. Is that, that there's, there, you need to clean that stuff up, right? 
Well, you do need to, yeah, for sure. That's a really fundamental cleanup is to make sure that uh, yeah, employees that are gone, that uh, those accounts cannot be used again and can't be reactivated. Uh, making sure that uh, yeah, all appropriate uh, types of things are done. We we love to look at that and say, wow, why don't we why don't we help you to automate that so that you know when you that that it actually can happen from the place that perhaps it should, where HR does you know they push a button and the right things happen in the right places. Uh, these things don't get there in one shot. But yeah. there are some main systems where you can look at, and for sure, Active Directory and Azure AD is one of those places where it's it's a fundamental place to stop uh, entry point into the company. And yet, it's uh, as Kurt pointed out, one statistic there, it's under constant attack. And if there's a weak spot in there, they'll find it, and uh, then they'll they find ways to escalate the privileges and and start doing the things they need to do. And and we've seen it. Uh, we've we've seen ransomware attacks constantly, and uh, we have to be ready for these things. And if you're watching this, don't presume that that even your CIO knows. Like, if you see something, say something is the old story. You've learned some stuff today. If you see something, say something. Thanks, guys. I'm going to give you a couple minutes to wrap up. we got a minute and a half and, and just to wrap up, and, and then uh, we'll let these people get back to the office, and, and we'll, we'll, we'll give them some ideas of how they can contact you. Sure. Oh, it's great. Our goal was uh, just to share a bit uh, on on this whole area, how we, you know, the situations that we've seen ourselves in. Um, I love to be able to give company names, but uh, when it comes touches on security, it's always such a such a sensitive area. And nobody wants their name uh, tied together with, uh, with you know some sort of a breach or anything else. Uh, but it, I really think it it is not always complex. It, you're, everything you're doing is complex. But the solutions are not always that difficult to come by, uh, and I think that if if we just take that step back, uh, we can find simple things that make a huge difference. And if you haven't done the MFA yet, as Kurt mentioned, do it. That's one of the simplest ways to secure uh, uh, those, especially those privileged accounts, uh, uh, as a very first step. Uh, there's not many that have not done it anymore. We've been surveying a lot of uh, a lot of customers out there, but it's it's a simple first thing. Make sure it's done. Kurt. Yeah, absolutely, and. Um... You know, it really depends where you where you are in this whole whole process. And uh, you know, if you're just don't have in-house expertise to address some of this stuff, really reach out to a partner like Itrogy that has, you know, just years and years and years of experience of addressing all of this for your specific type of company. And then, you know, if you are more more mature and you have some tools, you just need to add to the tool set to identify identify some of this, look for a good third-party trusted vendor like Quest. Uh, just go to quest.com, all, all our solutions are there. And um, as Jim highlighted too, it's like, just get started and just try to improve. Make sure your basics are covered, try to improve, know where you are. And it's actually, as we pointed out, not that difficult, right? So just uh, know the basics, know where you are. And, um, you know, I think through all that, you can sleep at night. <laughs> Good stuff. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you, to Ralph, to Kurt, Curtis. Um, the and thank you to IDG and to Quest. We we make the same request of all of the sponsors that you you don't do a commercial that you, you really give some great content. You guys did it, uh, knocked it out of the park. And again, I think we're all thankful as an audience it, out there in the audience. Thank you for turning up for this because we couldn't we couldn't and wouldn't do these things without you. But please fill in your your forms and let us know how we can be better at this at, in there and take. Note of that contact information. I'm sure that these guys will want to have, a, they'll love to have a conversation with you. And I've enjoyed enjoyed it uh, immensely over preparing for this. You'll get some good information from them as well. So thanks a lot. And until next time, I'm Jim Love from IT World Canada. Thanks, guys. Thank you.